Good afternoon from the UK and welcome to today's webinar, which is a collaboration between Mayor Brown and Transparency International UK. My name is James Ford and I am an associate in Mayor Brown's London office in the Compliance and Investigations team. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Rachel Cooper of Transparency International and Mishi Fazikas of the Central European University. They each bring a wealth of experience of policy work and research around corruption challenges in the healthcare sector. And I'm sure that their reflections will provide much food for thought, whether or not you and your organizations are directly or indirectly involved in the healthcare and pharmaceutical sector. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has really challenged the world's health systems and medical research beyond anything in our lifetime. From the push to develop treatments and an effective vaccine in record time, to the challenge of manufacturing and procuring ventilators and personal protective equipment, the challenges are tremendous. The pandemic has also thrown up another big question, namely this, how should health systems and pharma guarantee the millions of dollars and pounds flowing into the global response are spent with a focus on economy, efficiency, efficacy, and equity. Today, Rachel and Mishi will consider these questions and much more in sharing their reflections, both on what responsible business looks like in times of crisis and what lessons can be taken from the COVID-19 pandemic thus far. To give a quick overview of how today's webinar will run, Rachel will first share her reflections on the extent of the problem of corruption in health systems, the impact this is having, and how this is manifesting itself during the current pandemic. Then Mishi will walk us through some of the key pillars of the public procurement process insofar as it relates to healthcare, setting out the key actors in the procurement process and presenting some of the vulnerabilities in healthcare systems, as well as possible solutions to the problems. Following Rachel and Mishi's remarks, we will open up the session to Q&A, and at this point, you will be able to submit questions through the Q&A chat on your screen. Great, so first of all, I'd like to introduce Rachel Cooper in a bit more detail. Uh, Rachel joined Transparency International in November 2017 uh, to, to lead the Transparency International Health Initiative and its flagship project on open contracting in the health sector. Rachel, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, James. It's, it's great to join you. And perhaps to start, um, Rachel, could you tell uh, the listeners a little bit about the Transparency International Health Initiative itself? Of course. Um, the TI uh, Health Initiative is part of the Transparency International Global Movement Against Corruption. For anyone who's less familiar with us, Transparency International works through 100 plus chapters working to fight corruption at a national level. And the Health Initiative is a global overarching program striving to address and fight corruption in uh, particular instances of the health sector. Great. So, Rachel, we, we live in extraordinary times. Um, can, can you give us a sense of how widespread the problem of corruption itself is in health systems? Well, I, I can certainly give some estimates. Um, the, but just to put the estimates into context, global health spend is about $7.5 trillion annually. Um, so it's a massive um, amount of money. There are multiple actors. Um, the value chains are very long. Um, it's exceedingly complex. 
And the estimate is that about 7% um, of that global health spend is lost to corruption. Um, and that 500 billion annually is lost to corruption. And when I put that in a context that pre-COVID, so before the current pandemic, uh, the WHO estimated that $370 billion would have been needed annually to achieve the universal health coverage aspirations by 2030. I think we begin to see how big a problem it is. And uh, procurement, public procurement, is one of the major um, areas of corruption risk. But uh, there are also very human manifestations of that corruption risk. So um, at least 17% of people worldwide stated that they had paid a bribe when they were interacting with the healthcare sector. And that can be, you know, being um, asked for money by a doctor or told to go down the road to, um, uh, to um, access particular um, prescription drugs, but paying a bribe for something at that point of interaction. So we are talking a massive issue um, and a major obstacle to the, to the delivery of um, full, equitable, accessible, affordable health systems. Well, those numbers are, are tremendous. 7% uh, of the global health spend am amounting to around $500 billion. It, it really is tremendous. And Rachel, you've touched on a number of topics there, public procurement, the human manifestation of uh, corruption in health systems, indeed individuals, 17% of people having, you know, reporting themselves as, as paying bribes within the healthcare system. Can, can you give a bit more color around the, the impact on the health systems themselves in, in terms of human impact and also uh, impact around um, health policies themselves? Sure. Um, uh, for many countries, as I as I begin to indicate, begun to indicate, um, health is a major sector of expenditure, um, and it's expenditure from very hard-earned taxpayers. So when we're looking at it, we're looking at how that expenditure is delivered in the public interest. Is it accessible? Is it affordable? Um, is it uh, spent appropriately, and does it deliver equitable health care? And um, when, we're, when we see that, that it's not doing that, the sorts of things that we are, are seeing are um, people being denied access to appropriate health care. So absenteeism, absenteeism of health professionals who should be at a public health facility but are actually moonlighting in their own private practice and receiving effectively double payment for that. Um, or we're seeing um, delayed registration of clinical trial results. So um, pharma companies, universities, researchers have an obligation to report clinical trial results and they're not doing that in a timely way. And when that doesn't happen, we're then risking the possibility of duplication of that research. So that's one area. Similarly, when, when um, the impact of, of healthcare corruption really manifests, is it manifests in economic waste and in inefficiencies. Um, and it influences the allocation of resources. So it might be that um, particular governments or health ministers decide that they should be prioritizing a tertiary cancer clinic in a country when actually for value for money and health outcomes, it would be much more appropriate to be prioritizing primary health facilities. And um, equally, in terms of equitable health care, this is all about leaving no one behind. 
about ensuring that all those who should be able to access a level of health care can do so, that the most vulnerable have that access. And when you aren't able to do that, you end up um, impacting the, the level of trust that people have in health systems and ultimately the, the level of trust in governments that deliver those health systems. And also what you end up with at the end of the day is poorer health systems, poorer health outcomes. And those are delivered in the, in the sheer stats that might be in maternal mortality, it might be in newborn child mortality, it might be in um, uh, life um, expectancy, but ultimately it all manifests as lower health, com health outcomes. Yeah, so I think that the, the short message is that the, the impacts then can be tremendous. You talk about outcomes, you talk about trust in the systems, allocation of resources, economic waste. I mean, you, perhaps you could talk about the, the, the stages of the health system at which you know, corruption can really bite and, and how that can ultimately lead to all of these, these poorer outcomes, as you say. Sure. The TI Health Initiative really prioritizes three areas of the health value chain. And as I said a little at the beginning, that value chain is immensely complicated and immensely complex with multiple actors. But it starts at research and development, at the point that um, researchers, at the point that universities or pharma companies are delivering um, and developing new diagnostics, new treatments, new um, antibiotics, et cetera. Um, and we, as the health value chain, look at that point, particularly from the issue of clinical trials transparency. If we then move along that value chain, we come in the middle of it, essentially, to procurement, the point that governments and then lower levels of health system deliver the um, health provision, and that is by procuring services and treatments and facilities and infrastructure. And then right at the end of the value chain, you have that interaction, that service delivery point between patient and healthcare provider, so between your, your patient and your nurse or your doctor or your healthcare provider of, of whatever manifestation. So those are the really key points that we are prioritizing. So research and development, procurement and service delivery. There are others, um, but those are the ones that some of the main issues arise. So that's really interesting, Rachel, just really examining, as you say, the health value chain and looking at each stage from clinical trials and procurement right up to uh, service delivery itself. So how are we seeing these impacts manifest themselves during the current COVID-19 pandemic? And would it be fair to say that corruption is a key obstacle in the COVID-19 response? Yes, of, of course it is a massive obstacle. And I think it's most clearly manifest um, in research and development and in procurement. In research and development first, there is the sheer pressure that governments and indeed the public are putting on um, the scientific community to deliver new vaccines, new treatments, new diagnostics, new equipment, you know, more ventilators, more PPE, the sheer pressure that is on the scientific community to deliver the solutions to the situations that we all find ourselves in. So I think that's very clear from a research and development perspective. But equally in terms of procurement, procurement is, is immensely complex at the best of times how tenders are structured, where and how they're published, 
who is eligible to respond. And all of those things are being um, thrown up into the air, if you like, in this um, fight against the, the coronavirus um, and resolving the pandemic to minimize lives lost, to deliver health for all. But that is necessitating shortcuts. And the issue is what dangers are there in those shortcuts and how do we guard against losing rigor in favor of speed? And in terms of, I mean, shortcuts and procurement, I mean, two really important issues. Um, there, there's been a lot of press recently around you know, the procurement of PPE um, and some of the challenges that uh, governments and health systems are facing trying to obtain you know, limited resources. Are, are you seeing or do you have any comments on really the extent of the, the challenges faced in those procurement processes and, and really the, the fairness. You talked about equity earlier. So the, the fairness of those procurement processes as well, how is that impacting maybe the, the equity and the delivery of um, health services uh, within health systems? Sure. I mean, the, the sorts of risks that you see in procurement are reduced quality of goods and services. And as you said, everyone is trying to get more PPE. And we're already getting examples of PPE being delivered, I think, even in the UK, um, that isn't up to the, uh, you know, up to the kind of regulations or the certifications. Um, but we're also seeing inflated prices, price gouging. We're also seeing increased uh, personal discretion um, subjective um, uh, discretion about how to procure um, versus the kind of usual, more measured objectivity. And we're also seeing kind of biased allocation of resources. So standards, certification, the transparency of the whole process, all of those things are manifesting in a, in a massive issue around procurement. And I think I said earlier that up to 25% of health procurement expenditure is lost to corruption anyway. And when you throw all the usual systems up in the air, you are bound to get problems. So we've already seen reports of you know, a Slovenian gambling company who has no experience in healthcare being awarded a tender worth 25 million euros for PPE. We've seen a, the Brazilian government award a mask contract where the cost of those masks is up to 12 times higher than they were paying earlier this year. And guess who too, to a company with ties to the president. So we're seeing some very, very clear evidence of how those um, procurement challenges and obstacles are, are manifesting. And that manifestation, I suppose, comes from that combination of the, the increased pressure that you talked about, including on the scientific community around research and development, and, and then also the limited resources that are available. Um, and so you know, companies must be particularly um, cautious around these, you know, these heightened risks in many respects. How does this then during the current COVID-19 pandemic impact service delivery itself? Um, in service delivery, I mean, what we actually see is, is people um, hopefully having the courage to whistle blow, um, but it can also be in terms of people um, paying additional bribes or doctors um, shaving off an element of the limited supply of treatments for their family, that type of thing. Our, our TI chapter in Zimbabwe has already reported or seen more than 4,000 COVID-related contacts um, with issues like access to medication 
access to treatment, access to diagnostics. So it's, it's very clear. We've even seen reports of, you know, and, and it may be apocryphal, but um, of Russian oligarchs and the like who are, you know, pur purchasing scarce ventilators to outfit their own homes with makeshift clinics. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's all so fluid and there are so many loopholes and opportunities for people to, to take advantage. Um, but I'd also just like to come back a bit to the, uh, to the, the clinical trials issue and that area of research and development. Um, we've seen in previous pandemics how those pressures and opportunities might manifest. And we're already seeing that now. So um, anyone who's closer to, to this pandemic will have seen the reports of um, the US government um, registering hydrochloroquine as a possible treatment, and more recently, remdesivir as a possible treatment. And this is all about the, the governments and pharma beginning to position them, themselves for, you know, when and if the, the, the scale of opportunity to take advantage comes up. And there are questions over sample size, over the control group in the clinical trials that have been done with those two drugs. And then there are also a growing um, global um, noise about how intellectual property will be controlled, how compulsory licensing might enable um, treatments to be manufactured um, uh, other than, than through kind of classic um, patent mechanisms and how there may need to be a global patent pool. So the, yeah, the, the, the issues and challenges are not just for uh, governments and policymakers, but they really extend to the private sector, pharmaceuticals, um, and anyone really in that um, health value chain right from the, the start right up to you know, service delivery. Um, reflecting on then the, the research and the emerging trends you've seen during the, the pandemic, do you, do you have any reflections on sort of good and bad practices that we are seeing from both governments and businesses alike? Yes. I mean, I, I think we've already, and I've, I've mentioned a couple of those kind of more high-profile examples of, uh, if you like, bad, bad practice, you know, from Slovenia and Brazil and even from the UK, where I think, you know, there have been reports of, of a big shipment of PPE from Turkey that may not be up to, um, up to our standards. Um, if we're looking at, at better practice, um, I think there are some great examples, and Mishi may refer a bit later, um, to the Ukrainian Prozoro system, which enables open procurement tools, um, allows transparency of procurement, which can be monitored by civil society and has literally saved millions, um, admittedly before this COVID uh, pandemic, but has saved millions in um, procurement mechanisms for the Ukrainian government. Um, it includes information on the name of items, the price of items, the terms of the, of the contract, the supplier, etc. And it enables everyone to be able to see some of those red flags. Um, but we're also seeing that around clinical trials as well. So the Danish government, for instance, has introduced sanctions against pharma companies and universities and university research uh, groups that fail to publish their clinical trial results in a timely manner. As I said at the beginning, if clinical trial results aren't published in a timely manner, then you risk another uh, research group coming along and duplicating that effort. So it's not, it, it, it's not rocket science dealing with, the, you know, dealing with the kind of procurement and clinical trial obstacles that the pandemic throws up. It's all about doing so in an agile, transparent manner 
and, if you like, preparing in the best possible way for what will undoubtedly come, um, and that is the kind of retrospective accountability. So it, you don't have to cut all of those shortcuts. You choose which ones you, you do shortcut, and then you make sure that you do the appropriate due diligence um, around the ones that you leave in place um, uh, to, so that you, you, know, you, you assess your supply chain, um, you ensure that the new companies you're suddenly awarding tenders to aren't shell companies, um, and uh, you do your due diligence about beneficial ownership, who and how have those companies um, delivered in the past, um, who actually owns them. Um, and, you know, in that way, you can do some of what needs to be done um, to ensure that you don't lose the rigor with the speed. Excellent. Um, now, that's all really, really sort of insightful. And I think you know, your mention of the Ukrainian for zero system, that, that's something new to me. And perhaps this is a good opportunity um, to, to, to bring in Mishi uh, to the conversation. So um, to give a bit more background about uh, Mishi Fazitas, um, Mishi is an assistant professor at the Central European University's uh, School of Public Policy, and he's also the scientific director of an innovative think tank called the Government Transparency Institute. So perhaps to start, Mishi, uh, could you tell us a little more about your research interests and your work at the GTI? Great. Thanks a lot, James, for uh, having me over. I'm very glad to contribute to this uh, conversation and uh, uh, Q&A uh, afterwards. As a simple and, and quick background, uh, I have been doing research uh, at the university, but also uh, policy analysis at the GTI around a range of relevant topics uh, here. So we have been looking at corruption and corruption risk assessment using big data methods, but also collusion among uh, companies, in particular in public procurement uh, market, bidding market, transparency of public spending and what impact that has on corruption. Also, I have been increasingly working on price modeling, including healthcare uh, prices, using uh, very detailed item level public procurement data. And uh, all of these uh, analyses uh, nicely feed into anti-corruption policies and, and, uh, and the policy recommendations and understanding what works in anti-corruption. Now, this work has only, only initially started in, in Eastern Europe and, and a number of European countries, but by now, uh, my work and the work at uh, GTI has expanded to more than 50 countries around the world, uh, including the U.S., uh, a lot of Latin American countries, and a few cases in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and also Southeast uh, Asia. And... Um, as I already mentioned uh, very briefly, the, the approach is unique in a sense that uh, I apply big data methods and large administrative uh, data sets, analysis of such data sets, with, uh, together with qualitative uh, research field work and interviews and uh, careful analysis of the legal and regulatory framework so that you can have a, a comprehensive and, and robust assessment of both of corruption risk and also what works against corruption. Great. So you have um, a tremendous amount of, of wealth of experience from uh, your various research um, backgrounds. Um, so, Mishi, just drawing on that um, sort of broad breadth of research experience, can you share a bit about your perspective of the public procurement challenge in the healthcare sector? Great. Let me start from a broader perspective first. What is uh, public procurement? Who are the, the actors in general? And then we can zoom into healthcare specifics. So at the simplest level, public procurement is the process through which government and uh, public entities, semi-public entities, purchase goods and uh, services. 
Now, the diversity of these purchases is enormous. It, they really range for anything from uh, drugs and healthcare machinery to uh, nuclear power plants to uh, fighter jets to school meals. So really, is, is the diversity is, is enormous here. But at the basic level, uh, each of these processes have four distinct uh, components especially when it comes to uh, corruption in public procurement. So there is a tender for uh, awarding a contract. That's the, the fundamental goal of public procurement uh, processes, to award the contract uh, in a fair and, and open uh, procedure, fair and open uh, tender. And this can take multiple stages. Typically, there is a call for tender stage, and there is a contract award stage, and then, then we have a contract implementation stage. Now, we have two contracting parties, uh, two sides of the procurement transaction. On the buyer side, typically the public side is the contracting body, and on the supplier, typically the private side, there is a a winning bidder which uh, wins the contract and supplies the, the goods and services to the government. Now, when we talk about corruption in public procurement, then usually there is a second layer of relationship. So while the contract is formal, enforceable on court, uh, written down, there is usually an informal relationship underpinning corrupt deals in public procurement so that's where the actors on the public and the private sides have trust between each other. They can make deals, uh, informal deals, not written down deals. So they can really uh, corrupt the, the formal and well-regulated procedures to their own uh, benefit. Now, we have these um, four uh, generic components. And each of these uh, components, uh, elements of, of public procurement and corruption in procurement have a separate set of actors. So if you start from the contracting body side, there are procurement officials. Those are the officials who uh, uh, draft the specifications, who publish the procurement uh, tenders, and also who participate in um, uh, assessment boards who decide on who is winning. You have civil servants. Uh, some of these procurement officials might be civil servants. Might, some others might uh, approve the budget or supervise the process. And you have politicians who typically allocate budget, typically decide what, what gets uh, purchased at a very high level. On the supplier side, the private side, you have businessmen running the companies. You often have consultants uh, helping companies winning the bids. And often you have subcontractors who support the main supplier in delivering the goods. The tendering process itself is supported by a range of further actors. You can have a procurement authority, a uh, centralized purchasing body, which I will get back to in a second, it's very important in healthcare. And often you have law firms who uh, uh, support the legality uh, uh, and the formal uh, correctness of these uh, procedures. Now, when we talk about corruption, you have a separate set of actors, fixers, brokers, who, in a sense, sell their connections, their networks. They assure that the informal deals in procurement are actually uh, enforced and corruption takes place as, as intended. So you have these, these four components, the different actors related to these uh, components. Now, once you understand the general scheme, the question arises, what's specific about healthcare? Now, healthcare life follows this generic uh, structure. There, uh, it has uh, a number of specific components. So centralized uh, procurement uh, units, centralized purchasing bodies are uh, very typical in healthcare. So often what you would have a central body for a whole country or region buying drugs rather than hospitals uh, independently uh, buying um, drugs. You also have uh, purchasing decisions which are made by hospitals uh, themselves or, or uh, independent uh, general uh, practices, uh, purchasing typically smaller, uh, smaller value uh, goods and services like buying chairs, but also in many countries, hospitals might be able to purchase their uh, own uh, high-value machinery. 
which uh, creates its own uh, vulnerabilities. And finally, what's very important uh, in understanding uh, corruption and the nature of corruption in healthcare is that there are different goods and services uh, uh, purchased in this uh, sector. So it's very different kinds of corruption arising when we talk about uh, drugs or when we talk about uh, personal protective equipment like masks and gloves. And also very different when we talk about high value machinery like uh, X ray or OCT machine. Um, well, no, thank you, Mishi. That gives a really helpful overview of you know, public procurement and the maybe the, the machinations of the public procurement process and also the specific actors and, and some of the, the vulnerabilities. Can, can you perhaps give a little more color on um, you know, some typical vulnerabilities in, in public procurement generally and, and particularly in, in healthcare? You've touched on a few elements there, but could you perhaps draw out some of those vulnerabilities further? Great. I'm very happy to offer uh, a few examples uh, following on from this uh, structure. Uh, let me draw out for uh, widely cited schemes and uh, mention a little bit how uh, they can be measured or traced in, in large uh, data sets. The first one I wanted to mention is uh, tailoring specifications or tailoring the terms of a tender to one particular company. Now, that's, this leads to corruption because in public procurement, we typically expect uh, open competition uh, to take place and multiple companies able to supply a certain good or service, compete against each other, and this is something which assures value for money and which uh, lowers the risk of corruption. However, if the buyer specifies that it wants to buy a very specific uh, machinery, for example, which can only uh, be supplied by one company, then by defining the needs in a particular way, competition is excluded right from the beginning. Then the formal steps of the procedure can be uh, you know, open uh, tendering and it can, you know, follow all the rules. But at the end of the day, everyone knows that it's only one company who can bid and that company knows this as well. So it can overprice its uh, services or, or, or goods what it's selling. So this is a typical scheme, very hard to trace uh, uh, unless someone understands the details of the specifications. But there is an indicator which um, is widely used and it's easy to uh, deploy, which is single bidding on competitive markets. So if you see competitive markets with multiple suppliers and recurrently only one of them bids, uh, that suggests that probably something uh, uh, of, of this sort of tailoring specification is going on. The second vulnerability uh, is uh, related to misusing suppliers or networks of, of uh, companies. It can be ownership network or subcontracting uh, network. One widely uh, quoted uh, corruption risk is when the supplier or one of its owners is registered in a tax haven. Um, and in this context, tax havens are uh, carrying risk because they often use for hiding ownership because they often use for hiding uh, income, so avoiding taxation uh, on top of doing corruption. So this has been widely uh, evidenced by various paradise papers and various leaks. It is uh, a big, big uh, story in uh, public procurement. The third vulnerability, again, visible in many, many uh, cases, many countries, and in particular relevant in the COVID-19 situation, is when uh, buyers deliberately exploit flexibilities and emergency clauses to uh, avoid direct contracts as opposed to uh, go through competitive tendering. So in these situations, uh, the standard expectation of open competition is uh, relaxed. And in, instead of competition, there is direct award. And it's not hard to think why a direct award can get the, the contract and public money to the uh, connected or favored corrupt supplier. So emergency clauses are used not for uh, addressing genuine emergencies, but exploited to get the contract without competition to uh, a favored supplier. In this case, you can track the share of direct award, especially high value contracts. 
And the final type is uh, very insidious, but again, often quoted by experts, when the high value machinery is sold uh, on very competitive price, but the seller, the supplier knows that it will be able to have a maintenance contract related to the, the sale of the machinery. And that uh, maintenance contract will be a uh, vehicle for uh, extracting rent. And that can be done by uh, not properly checking the terms of that maintenance contract or allowing the supplier uh, um, uh, invoice uh, very high uh, uh, prices for basic things like moving the machine from one part of the room to another. So while the attention is usually on the on the machinery, the high value machinery side from civil society and journalists, looks over okay. But then the maintenance contract week after week actually allows the company to uh, corruptly extract rent. Well, thank you for those um, insights into the vulnerabilities. Um, you, you've spoken actually of, of four specific vulnerabilities in, in healthcare around tailoring specifications, suppliers, buyer exploitation, particularly around emergency clauses, and also high value machinery. Now, what can be done to strengthen these uh, procurement within health systems to address these vulnerabilities? And in particular, because we have a, a, a few people joining today who are from corporates in the healthcare sector and, and pharma sector, you know, how do corporates fit into those solutions? Uh, there is a uh, wide literature on, on solutions and the, the expected effects of these solutions. Let me just pick out uh, three particular uh, solutions, which I think are particularly relevant in the COVID-19 situation, but also offer um, avenues for corporate engagement and, and opportunity for more uh, open and fair uh, competition. So the three solutions I'm going to mention are e-procurement and various forms of e-procurement systems, then civil society and corporate monitoring of uh, public procurement tenders, and finally, data analytics and data-driven intelligence supporting efficient and, uh, and uh, uh, high integrity procurement. So we start with the first slide looking at uh, e-procurement. Uh, I would like to underline that e-procurement systems, while, while widely used around the world, they come in many different forms. Some focus, and in fact, most of them focus on the tendering and contract award phase. Um, electronic uh, administration of procurement procedures is uh, only done uh, uh, for the first two phases of procurement, and contract implementation is typically uh, done on paper, on in different systems. But there are some more comprehensive systems where the full uh, tender cycle is uh, done, uh, run through the procurement system. What you can see on the slide is um, a result from uh, three impact evaluations in India, Indonesia, and Bangladesh, looking at the various impacts of the procurement uh, uh, intro uh, system introduction. And all, all three um, countries have seen e-procurement systems, which largely focus on, on the tendering and, and bidding phases and to some degree on the contract award phase, so really the beginning of the procurement uh, cycle. And what's very interesting is that while you would think, oh, this is you know, very straightforward, e-procurement uh, is efficient, lowers transaction cost, opens up market, that's all great. Actually, the evidence is very mixed, and it's mixed to a large degree because the response from the market, the response from suppliers is a key driver for anti-corruption effect of these systems. And depending on how the supplier markets respond, the results will be very different. So uh, not uh, going through uh, each of these impacts in detail, just picking out a few interesting things. Uh, in India and Indonesia, the number of bidders 
did not go up as a result of introducing a procurement. And this is surprising because you would imagine that if you have to bid on paper, send in bids, uh, you know, by, by post, that, uh, you know, it's cumbersome, that's uh, costly. So if all this happens online, then suddenly more companies will do. This is not, was not what we found in, in India and Indonesia, but it did happen in Bangladesh. It had a major effect. However, uh, you could also see impact on the quality of suppliers, the quality of uh, companies bidding, and in particular if they are coming from outside uh, of the region, so uh, markets opening up, not in terms of more companies bidding, but different companies, companies coming from outside of the immediate region of uh, locality of the buyer. So you see a diverse set of impacts, and it's very important that some of these result in higher quality of suppliers, higher quality of of the construction project, but also it can mean, and that's the Bangladeshi case, that uh, prices also go down, so the, the discount companies offer uh, uh, is, uh, are, are increasing. So e-procurement then some is, 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 a, is a potential solution which can help, uh, especially in uh, situations like COVID-19 where we have to purchase quickly, we have to purchase at low transaction cost, and uh, we want to have still transparency of the system. We want to see still be able to trace uh, processes and outcomes. And this is where uh, uh, corporate responses come in. Because if you have a, an effective e-procurement system, uh, uh, easy to use user-friendly e-procurement system in place, uh, the, the enormous pressure to buy on time and high quality uh, products uh, related to fighting the COVID-19 uh, crisis, then new markets open up and new opportunities open up for companies and that could break up uh, entrenched corrupt networks. That could mean that the crisis is actually an opportunity for more competition rather than more corruption. The second uh, example of uh, successful or, or promising uh, solutions to uh, corruption in public procurement uh, concerns civil society and corporate monitoring of um, public procurement procedures. And one example which I highlighted here uh, on this slide is coming from uh, Slovakia, but there is a, a number of, of uh, monitoring sites and uh, monitoring uh, mechanisms which work uh, in a similar way. So in, in uh, the case of Slovakia, and this is well documented by Transparency International chapter in Slovakia, the whole story started in 2010 with um, active transparency becoming the norm, and active transparency meaning that uh, publication and openness by default rather than by, by request or, or, or film of information uh, request. And this active transparency uh, led to an enormous uh, flow of, of information on contracts to the public domain. And then this information, while it was represented on a monitoring watchdog portal without indicators, just the, the source data, uh, the basic information reported to the public in a, in a concise way, this um, explosion of knowledge has led to, on the one hand, an enormous increase in the the number of people uh, using this site, uh, one survey reports 11% of the population having checked the site at one point. This is a huge number. But also, crucially, Slovak journalists had used this data to report on wrongdoing, uh, alert authorities, including the competition authority and, and courts and investigators, auditors, to uh, look into a particular cases. This has been uh, money, uh, reported that led to an increase in uh, articles reporting on, on public procurement and corruption in public procurement. And also, there have been a number of high-profile cases when people have been investigated and, uh, and companies uh, being uh, sanctioned for wrongdoing in procurement. So that's, that's the good part of the story, and this is something we have seen in a number of countries, including Georgia and Mexico and others. Now, of course, the big question is how behavioral change in government is, is the same type um, uh, leading to uh, a fundamental change in the rules of the game and integrity being the norm rather than the exception. And this is, I think, where uh, corporate monitoring comes into place, where bidding firms 
uh, use complaints mechanisms, arbitration board, to report on tenders which where they cannot uh, bid because the terms are uh, too restrictive. Recall uh, me discussing uh, um, tailored specifications, but also complaints against unfair um, assessment of their bids. So really use the channels and publicity afforded to them by civil society monitoring to support uh, and maintain openness and uh, uh, fair uh, bidding and assessment. The third solution I would like to highlight concerns uh, real-time and comprehensive data analytics uh, supporting uh, anti-corruption. And this is nicely building on the two other solutions. I mentioned the procurement and uh, monitoring portals and goes one step further. So here we don't just use data, which is on the portal, we don't just summarize it and make sense of it, but we build performance indicators, risk indicators on top of these uh, data sets and use these uh, uh, data-driven insights to drive uh, anti-corruption work, both in the government and outside of it. So I brought two examples. One is the uh, opentender.eu portal, which has uh, 33 portals in 33 European countries, basically brings data from e procurement systems, uh, cleans the data, and uh, um, improves its quality and makes a sense of it that it standardizes uh, ba basic terms. And then on top of this, there are risk indicators such as uh, single bidding, which I mentioned. Uh, tax haven registration of suppliers, also uh, something I mentioned. Non-competitive uh, uh, tendering, such as direct contracting, which uh, has been mentioned. So really, it's possible to come from these vulnerabilities, these segment frequently cited stories, to measurement, and you can put all of that into uh, a dashboard, an analytics dashboard. And that can uh, further uh, uh, support uh, journalist work that can further support uh, voters' decision whether they want to vote for a different party because they see their, their say their municipal administration has enormously high risk, and that can be also used by audit bodies. And that's uh, the other example on this slide, uh, supporting the work of auditors in the European Investment Bank and also at the European Commission. Their high-risk uh, entities, and that can be buyers, that can be uh, suppliers of certain markets, can be identified using risk indicators and data analytics on these uh, monitoring portals. And these uh, uh, indicators point at uh, certain uh, areas of uh, policy intervention or uh, investigation and audit so that uh, we can implement the rules, we can enforce the rules uh, and fight corruption effectively. Great. Well, thank you, Mishi, for your insights into the public procurement challenge in the healthcare sector um, and going into you know, the key actors, vulnerabilities of health systems, and also presenting some of the possible solutions in uh, considerable detail. Um, I think this is a good opportunity now to open up the floor to Q&A. Um, so if you do have any questions, um, please do submit them in the Q&A chat box on your screen. Um, so the first question we have in is, whether um, you, you could reflect on the role of uh, independent pre-shipment inspection in the avoidance of fraud, uh, corruption, and substandard good, goods issues. I think the context here is whether independent checks, for example, at ports, may present a possible solution to mitigating uh, risks around fraud, corruption, and, and product quality. So perhaps, um, Mishi, uh, would you like to tackle this question first? Thanks a lot, James, and welcome everyone uh, in person uh, as well from me. Uh, great to see you listening in. So yes, this is a, a very important question, the, the point of, of how to use uh, inspections and checks to, to avoid corruption and, and other problems. 
So pre-shipment inspections are quite naturally part of a broader arsenal of, of avoiding uh, fraud and, and corruption. Now, while they can be effective in normal times, the, the problem is that they work well in tandem with others, right? So if you know your uh, supplier, a well-tested uh, supply route, uh, in the company and, uh, and, the pro and the producer known, the, the risks are anyways lower and you know what to look for. If you are um, engaging the brand new supplier and you're unsure about where really the goods are coming from, then uh, the, the expectations from pre-shipment inspections are, are very, very high. And while it can be an effective tool, it, on its own it um, can be gamed, right? So if you have a large shipment, checking a couple of boxes might not give you the right information. And also, uh, often these uh, uh, inspections are um, superficial from the perspective that you cannot check the full uh, uh, set of uh, characteristics uh, and qualities which underpin the usability and usefulness of the good. So yes, uh, can be useful, but uh, no, without the support of all the other uh, uh, due diligence and other other uh, information it can be uh, little and um Rachel, might you have any sort of perspectives from a, a a broader sort of policy perspective um from the t i angle Yes, thanks very much james i I think that um we have to acknowledge that um as Mishi said that pre shipment um inspections have a have a role to play. Um, but in an emergency situation like this, um, where it, you know regular systems are so different um, and uh, much more complex, and you know no one quite knows how how they're operating, I'm not sure they're necessarily going to going to uh, going to give an answer. And remember that we are talking about diagnostics and about therapeutics. Um, and uh, potentially about vaccines in the end. Um, and, you know, testing those um, as a pre-shipment requires in, in many situations some quite sophisticated um, mechanisms. And I'm just not sure that, um, that the effort is, um, is, is going to reap the reward. And I think really this comes back down to, you know, choosing how you, uh, how you measure your corruption risk um, and how you monitor those risks um, and balancing that kind of rigor with speed. Where, where do you cut the corners um, and where do you really put your effort? Yeah, no, that's that's really, really good point. Um, now, we've had an interesting question come in um, here. So um, perhaps, Rachel, you can tackle this one first. Um, has the increasing politicization of relationships between the US, China, and the WHO in particular contributed to greater risks of corruption in responses to COVID-19? And are, is there any credible basis to the accusations being leveled at the WHO? Thanks, James. This is, this is an interesting one. Uh, and uh, we have been asked several times in the last couple of weeks um, about the accusations um, that are being levelled at the WHO, um, and really, I think that um, you know the multilateral community um, and multilateral organisations are immensely complex, um, and uh, I'm sure that you know none of them are perfect. In fact, you know absolutely there are imperfections across them, um, but uh, this is not. I feel the moment for us to be having a post-mortem or to be holding WHO to account. Um, everyone, companies, governments, and the WHO will be subject to retrospective accountability when we get there. Um, but now, in the midst of the pandemic, I don't think um, is the moment to be to be trying to do that. Um, there will undoubtedly be lessons to be learnt. We're all going to have to learn those. Um, and there will be changes to be made. Um, uh, in terms of whether it's increased the, uh, the risk, I think that where it does potentially increase the risk 
is um, that there's actually greater coordination um, and greater pooling of effort is ultimately going to get us better results. And you know, I think that many of the examples that we've heard around you know government systems, pharma going it alone, um, are increasing the risks of corruption. Um, so I think that at the margins, yes, uh, the you know the tensions probably are. Bide our time for the post mortem on the WHO. Uh, um, just for listeners, I appreciate we've we've come up to the the hour, but since we've got a few other questions coming in, um, we might just take the opportunity to spend another sort of ten minutes on questions. Uh, a recording of this webinar should be made available later this week as well. Um, if you do have to drop off, um, Mishi, I'd like to maybe start with you on the next question. Um, we were talking a little bit about OECD standards um, just before this webinar. Um, do you have any view on the effectiveness of the OECD standards and guidelines for businesses in respect of public procurement risk? Yes, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's great. We were really just talking about the OECD guidance a, a few minutes ago. So um, the issue with the, um, the OECD standards and guidelines is that uh, they tend to be very uh, well thought through uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, these uh, standards and guidelines are very high level, and they have no uh, direct, uh, you know, there's no strong monitoring or enforcement mechanisms um, attached to them. So really, their impact on practice, business practice, uh, procurement, tendering practice, comes through the, the governments who are willing to implement them or the companies who are willing to, to follow them. Now, having, the, uh, research, having researched uh, uh, corruption in public procurement for about 10 years now, I, I really don't think the, the corrupt uh, businessmen or, or politicians or bureaucrats care about any of this, because they, on the other hand, they have big money waiting for them, right? So I think the standards and guidelines can be effective indirectly, but there, there needs to be a, a domestic electorate or, or uh, international businesses or, or the WTO or, or the you know, um, international bodies which can put weight behind these standards and guidelines, otherwise uh, they remain on paper. Great. And, and Rachel, do you, do you have anything to add on OECD standards? No, that's I, I'm I'm um, I I totally agree with with Mish's response there. Great. Um, and so to the next question, um, understand that until at least February there was um, a lot of pressure, particularly in in Northern Europe, around the uh, introduction of quite complex sustainability criteria into procurement processes. Um, now some have expressed the, a concern that. Uh, this pressure may, um, to, in, in, in the range of these goals, may actually give greater opportunities for corrupt practices to hide. And so the question here is, um, is there a risk that maximizing sustainability could have an adverse impact on the anti-corruption agenda? Um, Rachel, do you have any thoughts to that? Yes, I think this is an interesting one, and I I think you know the, the sustainability agenda is um, so complex. But but when we're talking about societal goals, we are talking about those ultimate health outcomes um, that I was referring to that are you know are um, impacted by um, corruption um, and. Uh, and I think that you know when we have to really unpick what we're talking about in sustainability agenda. So we're talking about the affordable healthcare, about the accessible healthcare, about the equity of it, the appropriateness of it, um, and how that ultimately impacts on health outcomes and societal goals. Um, and uh, so I, I, 
don't necessarily think that um, that there's a you know a kind of a cause effect relationship um, here. I think it's um, not quite as simple as as that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm coming at this from a global health perspective, um, and uh, I think it's it's more about some of those other issues and how you are really factoring in all elements of society. And Rachel, I think the next one is is also Sorry, for James, you. Uh, oh yes, Missy. Me, I just just jump in with a few points because Rachel uh, raised very uh, interesting points, and and I think. Procurement is subject to a number of potentially competing expectations, value for money, compliance, and following the, the complex rules, uh, you know, trade, uh, employment, and then there is now uh, sustainability more, more recently. And I think um, while it's absolutely uh, it's great and absolutely necessary to incorporate sustainability expectations in, in procurement, we need to make note of the fact that Corruption often uh, thrives on complexity uh, because complex procedures and technical uh, specifications allow for hiding. So in as much as uh, adding yet another set of expectations increases complexity, that can foster uh, uh, corruption. In addition, as, as Rachel mentioned, this is, this is a relatively new expectation. So we're not uh, always sure about how to incorporate them into standard procurement procedures, how to measure them, how to weigh them. And again, uncertainty and subjectivity in the criteria, subjectivity in the assessment enables uh, corruption and uh, limits the capacity of external third party actors to uh, hold actors to, to account in the procurement uh, sphere. And finally, just uh, you know, drawing on a couple of examples, I'm, I'm Hungarian, and, and uh, this has been actually abused uh, quite a few times uh, uh, already now, buying local and minimizing transportation costs and the accompanying uh, CO2 emissions is great. But if buying local means my friend with whom I went to high school and the connected uh, firm or, or the or the local businessman who funded my uh, local uh, political party campaign, then you know buying local and sustainable uh, equals uh, uh, corrupt and favoritistic. So there is a fine line to walk here, to pursue these new set of goals, which are very important, and at the same time allowing for for anti-corruption to to uh, keep uh, to be observed. Great, thank you for that, Missy. Um, so there's a question from a civil society context now. So what types of measures, and Rachel, perhaps you'd be best placed to start on this, what types of measures should civil society be demanding in the COVID context in terms of uh, reducing corruption risks? The question has been cast quite broadly around um, you know, contracts with shell companies, but I, I'm, I'm sure there's a, um, a healthcare element to it too. Yes, thanks, James. Um, the role of civil society is incredibly important here. And I think that, you know, there's a superficial element that you kind of think, oh, we're all in lockdown, so it's much more difficult for civil society um, to play its part. I actually think that civil society's role is even more important. And when we're talking about civil society, we are talking about social accountability in the broadest sense. So it is citizens' groups. Um, operating virtually, it is the media, um, it is freedom of information, um, and if you if you put all of those factors together, um, I um, I think that you can have still have real impact. And indeed, we have seen um, uh, working within the TI um, Health Initiative and our Open Contracting Initiative in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, a couple of very specific examples of this, um, both in, in Kenya, um, uh, where they've challenged um, the government on particular procurements, um, and, you know, ha and there have been changes, um, and you know, procurement officials have been um, moved on. So um, I, I think that um, it's exceedingly important um, and uh, that, it, it, you know, we are in a climate 
where pre-COVID we were putting more and more pressure um, rightly to have beneficial ownership registers so that um, citizens and civil society as a whole can play its part and can interrogate um, you know, the owners um, of uh, companies that have been awarded tenders. Um, and I think that you know, as part of the kind of accountability that will come up in the end, um, I think it's going to play into this drive for increased um, beneficial ownership transparency. And I think that's exceedingly important. Yeah, and Mishy, do you have anything to, to add on the role of civil society? Yeah, yeah just a few things uh, Rachel very nicely uh, summarized. So I think uh, civil society or any um, uh, external actors, uh, we cannot demand to to uh, stick to the same speed, you know, like 30 days of advertisement, things like that. We cannot really demand to go through the same uh, time-consuming procedures, uh, right? If you need to build a hospital in two weeks, you have to get going tomorrow, right? So I think um, we have to recognize that there are risks, but there are situations then you have to uh, let go on the short term. And then it's really important that this is a short term uh, uh, need which, which we need to react to. Uh, and then what can civil society do? First, we have to delimit the scope of these exceptions. Exceptions are justified, but they should not be abused, right? So if you're buying something which can arrive in a month time, well, you can uh, actually follow the standard uh, procedure, uh, procedures and checks, right? So, very carefully, you have to very carefully watch where where the exceptions are applied and whether they are used or not. And I also want to emphasize the the timing of all, all this and and what civil society can do. Yes, speed is important. We have to do a, a small number of things immediately, but there is exposed accountability. And I like in this uh, context uh, we also just discussed this with Rachel and James. But the IMF put out on this, I, I like the title, keep the receipt, right? Okay, you, you are you know, busy saving lives, but it doesn't mean accountability stops. You can say we wait two weeks with the data, fine, but then it should be out there. We should be able to verify it and use that to hold the decision makers to, to account. So putting out data should be uh, not, uh, should be the basic. Uh, expectation, even if you know we we, we accept it to arrive a little uh, later. And finally, often I, I see this argument that we need to use uh, uh, procedures and systems outside of our standard e-procurement systems. Well, e-procurement systems have been built to uh, lower transaction costs and make purchasing easy. So it's not true in every country, but most countries these systems are actually making purchasing easier. So when you see arguments that, oh, yes, we want to buy outside because that's easier, well, you should ask questions. Is this exception justified or actually our systems built for low transaction costs are, are better uh, able to cope with the demand, the speed of demand and quantity of demand? Great. And so we, we have listeners today who have joined from a, a range of backgrounds, um, from medical research pharma and public health policy to uh, manufacturing financial institutions and academia. Um, as, a, as a final question, perhaps first Rachel and then Mishi, um, what key message do you hope for organizations to take away from today's webinar? Thanks, James. Yes. Um, I, uh, I've said the mantra kind of don't lose the rigor with the speed. Um, I think that in this immediate phase, that's a very key message. But I actually want to focus um, a bit more on the future um, perspective of this. And my take on this and my message to, to every type of organization, to government, the private sector, um, to the civil society, is that we've all been impacted um, and we are all going to remember this. And we're all going to remember how other stakeholders have reacted. So I think we are going to be challenging WHO. I think we are going to be looking much stronger at um, the behavior of pharma, at the pricing of pharma. We're going to be challenging 
um, uh, patents rules and intellectual property. We're going to be looking um, and we're going to remember how our individual governments have or have not been um, subject to corruption um, in their emergency procurement. And we're going to be looking for our governments to be making better decisions in the future and assessments about risk. You know, maybe governments need to be building in more um, anti-bribery and anti-corruption provisions, um, as companies in, indeed do. And we're also going to be looking at the private sector, and we're going to remember the private sector stakeholders that have demonstrated the values that we respect and that have contributed to getting us all out of this situation. Um, so I, I think my underlying message um, uh, to, to take away is really around that. It's, it's around thinking ahead to the retrospective accountability, but then where and how do you want to be seen and positioning um, as we all emerge from this? Because that is going to determine the success and the trust that everyone has in their own individual stakeholders for the future. Thank you, Rachel. That's a very powerful and clear message. Uh, Mishi, do, do you have a, a final message for today? Yes, it's hard to talk after Rachel because so much like uh, how, how she put it. So let me just really add one, one additional uh, point, which is we often see uh, such crises as opportunities for corruption, opportunities for things to, to fall apart and, and uh, go down a hill. But actually, if you think about what corruption, especially systemic corruption in, in, in a lot of countries, is entrenched power relations, uh, political and business elites holding on to power and not giving access to, uh, to outsiders. So crises are actually, especially the COVID-19 crisis we are living through, are actually an opportunity to open up these entrenched networks, to challenge them, because they are themselves challenged by the situation. And then if you think of this in very simple market terms, you have a lot of countries where uh, favored or well-known uh, suppliers, you know, corrupt or just connected, uh, or what have you, they have been dominating the market. And suddenly there is an enormous uh, uh, supply problem, an enormous disruption to supply chains, an enormous capacity constraint for a couple of uh, products and services. And this is where even the most entrenched corrupt government might decide to actually go out to the open market and, and uh, you know, like it or not, but try out it with some uh, non-connected firms because the need to tackle the crisis is so much greater than their, the, the immediate expectations of their friends to, to get rich. So I think for businesses with innovative solutions, businesses with, um, with uh, capacity to enter new markets, this is an opportunity. And this is where we should push this is where these companies should uh, also team up with civil society, journalists, and uh, if possible, audit bodies that we should, we should push for more openness because we have the, the pressure for it. We need that openness to, to help and save lives. And as a side product, we might be able to fight corruption uh, as well. Thank you. Um, so just to wrap up then, um, thank you to everyone who has joined today's webinar. Um, thank you for your engaging questions. Uh, we hope it has given you much food for thought on what responsible business looks like in times of crisis. And particular thanks to our speakers today, uh, Rachel Cooper of Transparency International's Health Initiative and Mishi Fazikash of the Central European University. It's been absolutely fantastic to hear your insights today on the important topic of corruption in the healthcare and pharma industry. So thank you both. Thanks a lot. Thank you, James.